I'm uh, glad you had a chance to come out on this uh, beautiful weekend. And uh, yeah, what I'd like to do today is uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the research I do, the things that I uh, think about and uh, that excite me, that uh, keep me up at uh, night. As Kurt uh, mentioned, um, I'm a, um, a physics faculty, I'm a researcher, I'm a lecturer, and um, uh, what I'll talk to you about is uh, some of the questions that uh, have uh, yeah, followed me and inspired me probably for the last uh, 20 or 30 years, since, uh, since I was a kid like uh, yeah, some, some of you here. So what I'll talk about are neutrinos, universe, and ghost particles. Who has heard about the universe? Everyone, yeah. Who has heard about ghosts? Yes, everyone has heard about ghosts. Has anyone heard about neutrinos yet? Oh, excellent. So it seems like we have some experts uh, here. So when we uh, think about the universe, most of the time you think about a picture like this. You think about stars, you think about clouds, and you think about pretty structures. If you uh, take a telescope and you can go up to the Leitner Observatory here on Science Hill and uh, on a clear day look through the telescope, you, you might even see uh, some more structure in there. You might see something like galaxies, like the galaxies uh, that we li live in. A uh, um, collection of uh, stars and uh, clouds that um, yeah, we find in our universe. Now, if you take a really powerful telescope, like uh, some of the astronomers and some of the colleagues that we have here on campus, you might see something like this. This is a picture taken with the uh, Hubble Space Telescope that looks very deep into space. It looks at very faint stars. And what you can see there is it's not uh, quite as crisp as the previous image, but you see lots of little stars. You see the structure of galaxies. And all of these things you can see essentially with, with your eye, as long as your, power, uh, your telescope is uh, yeah, powerful enough. If you take a very broad look, if you take a step back and look at the universe and you look at all the things that are in the universe, then it might actually look like this. The universe is not a homogeneous place. It's a place where you have structures, where you have collection of galaxies. And uh, this is what we think the large scale structure of the universe might actually look like. So it's almost like this uh, spider web type of thing and you have uh, yeah, clusters of uh, matter of stuff uh, that's um, yeah, in the universe. Now all of these things are studied with astronomy. Essentially what astronomers do is they take the telescope, sometimes a very powerful telescope, and they look into the universe. So if you take a telescope, whether it's on Earth or in space, you can essentially look back in time. You look at uh, galaxies and you look at the light that comes from the very early universe. And uh, so what these telescopes do is they see a cross-section of the visible universe. Now what I am doing is um, I'm not an astronomer. I'm a particle astrophysicist. I'm interested in connecting the very big universe to the very small. And basically what I'm interested in is understanding how the very tiny things that make up matter, that make up us, affect the large scale of the universe. Who has heard about atoms and nu nu nuclei? So basically the stuff that we are made of, the structure of matter, consists of atoms. Atoms, you can think about it, it's like a, like a little ball or something, but it has structure inside. And inside these atoms, we find things like um, electrons, we find neutrons and protons, these are particles, nucleons that make up atoms, and we find even smaller structure. So the research that I do is trying to understand the structure inside the matter that makes up galaxies, that makes up humans, that makes up uh, stars. And so to do this, we go very deep inside these atoms. And uh, for those of you who uh, want to get a sense of the scale, how deep inside we go, if this is an atom, 
then the structures inside are really, really tiny. The neutrons and protons that make up the atom are about one ten thousandth of the size of an atom. And then uh, you go even further, and the quarks that make up neutrons and protons, the little uh, parts inside uh, these neutrons and protons, they are 100 millionth of uh, the size. So it gets small very, very quickly. So the research we do is essentially looking into atoms, looking into nuclei, understanding the structure, and trying to relate it to the big universe and what we see in, um, yeah, in the universe nowadays. Now, you might ask, so where do neutrinos come in? It turns out that matter is made out of building blocks. It's like a Lego set. You know, you have your yellow Lego, you have your red Lego, you have your blue Lego, and you put them all together and you can build things. And that's how we think about it. We have what's called elementary particles. These elementary particles are the building blocks of matter. And among these elementary particles, there are, there's a group of particles that are called neutrinos. And uh, these are the things that I'll be telling you about and uh, why they excite us and why they are uh, yeah, interesting to us. Now, you, you don't have to worry about the details here. Just remember that there are actually three different kinds of neutrinos, and we'll get back to that. It's like uh, having three flavors of, of ice cream. Now, you might wonder, well, if there are so many Lego pieces, why do we care about neutrinos? Well, neutrinos are really special in many ways. First of all, there are really lots of them. There are billions of them. The other thing is neutrinos almost move at the speed of light. Um, you may have heard that the fastest we can go in the universe is at the speed of light. And neutrinos almost reach that. No one else can be as fast as uh, light and neutrinos. Turns out that neutrinos almost have no mass. They are almost like light, but not, not quite. And the fourth point is that neutrinos are really very weakly interacting. They can go through everything. They can go through you, they can go through the Earth, they can go through stars. And so what we do is we use neutrinos, the things that we can't see, to explore what I call the invisible universe. So first, on the point of how many neutrinos there are. Everyone might know what a cubic centimeter is. It's like a sugar cube. So take a sugar cube. And in this volume of space, you have on average in the universe 330 neutrinos. So in every little cube here. And it turns out that this is actually quite a bit. Because this is a billion times more than we have protons, the other things that make up nuclei and matter. So if there are a billion more neutrinos than protons in the universe, you ask, well, what role do neutrinos play? Are they important or do we care? And this is what we are trying to um, yeah, answer with the work um, yeah, that we do. Now, it turns out that uh, there are lots of neutrinos, but they have very little mass. And if you take all the neutrinos in the universe and compare them to the stars, it turns out that there are almost as many neutrinos as there's mass in stars. So the next time you step outside at night, you look at the sky, you look at all the stars, you might see the Milky Way if you're in a really dark spot. Imagine there's as much up there in terms of neutrinos that we can't see, but that are all around us. But even though there's so much up there in terms of neutrinos, it turns out it's only a really small fraction of the universe. It turns out that the stars and neutrinos are less than a percent of the entire universe. Most of the universe is dark, and it consists of stuff that we can't see, and we don't even know what it is. And uh, physicists and astronomers have given it names like dark matter and dark energy because we really have no clue what it is, but we know it is out there. So if you look at this uh, uh, figure here, this pie chart, the stuff that we are made of and the stuff that we see is this little sliver. The rest of the universe is still unexplored. And so it's really up to you, 
when you grow up and hopefully you'll become scientists, then you can figure out what all the rest is. I don't think we'll learn this uh, in my lifetime. Now, I said that neutrinos are really weakly interacting particles. Well, what does this really mean? So I decided to uh, consult um, a semi-expert, and this is a quote from Douglas Adams, mostly uh, uh, harmless, and he actually wrote in this book about neutrinos. And he said, well, it would be an unusual nanosecond in which the Earth was not hit by several billion passing neutrinos. It all depends on what you mean by hit, of course, because uh, seeing as matter consists of almost entirely nothing at all. So what is he saying? He's saying that there's really not much that makes up matter, that it's a lot of empty space. And uh, he goes on to say the chances of a neutrino actually hitting something as it travels through um, uh, space or the, through this emptiness is the same as dropping a ball from an airplane and hitting an egg sandwich as someone is walking by on Earth. Now, let me just uh, illustrate what uh, he really means by that. So this is, uh, this is what uh, it's like. So just imagine, you have all these neutrinos around you and you ask yourself, are they going to hit you? So it's like dropping a ball from an airplane and uh, it, it drops and drops, it uh, gets closer to Earth, and then you just imagine you are having lunch and walking by and plop. So what is the chance of this happening? So next time you walk with your plate outside and you see an airplane flying to New York, think about it. If someone opened the window and uh, dropped the ball, would they hit you? It's very, very, very unlikely. And this is how unlikely it is for a neutrino to hit anything in you or in other matter. Now, you, you can see that with, with all of this, neutrinos are pretty special. There are lots of them out there, they move at the speed of light, but they really don't hit very much. And this means that with neutrinos, we can not only explore the universe that we can see, galaxies, but we can go back in time. And our theory is that about 14 billion years ago, the universe started with a Big Bang. It was a, uh, essentially a big explosion of energy, and the universe uh, expanded after that. And in the very early times, maybe a second or minutes after the explosion, the universe was just a big soup, a big soup of stuff. And it was so thick that not even light could come out. And uh, light could only come out very much later. But with these neutrinos that are so weakly interacting, we can actually go back in time and probe the very early universe. Now you might ask, well, all of these neutrinos that I'm telling you about, so where do they come from? Well, it turns out that neutrinos mostly come from what we call nuclear reaction. So you have a nucleus, an atom that decays, it falls apart. And when it falls apart, breaks apart, we get some other particles out, some other stuff. And amongst this stuff, there are these neutrinos. Now it turns out that this falling apart happens in many places in uh, nature. We have neutrinos that were created at the beginning of time in the Big Bang, and uh, those are left over in space, and I mentioned they're about 300 per cubic centimeter. We have neutrinos that come from exploding stars. So when a star comes to the end of its life, it uh, goes through um, a process that ends in what's called a supernova, an explosion. And uh, neutrinos can be pr produced in this process. We have neutrinos that come from high energy um, cosmic rays from uh, space. We have neutrinos that come from the sun. 
So uh, you can look at the sun and you not only get light out of it, but you get all of these neutrinos because they come from the nuclear reactions inside the sun. And then it turns out we have also neutrinos that are produced in the atmosphere. We have neutrinos that come from inside the Earth even. And we have man-made neutrinos from accelerators, reactors, and things like that. So there are all sorts of neutrinos um, around us. Now, the uh, scientific story of the neutrino started in uh, 1930. There was a scientist called Wolfgang Pauli. And um, he was studying these nuclear decays. And uh, he was looking at what happens when a nucleus decays and what you get out. And there was something that just didn't quite make sense. It puzzled him. He couldn't uh, add up um, yeah, all the energy that came out of it. And so he did something that at the time was quite surprising. He just said, you know, there has to be another particle involved. At the time, we didn't know that there were all of these different building blocks of matter, that there were all of these Lego pieces. So he postulated this. And uh, then it took uh, some experimentalists some 25 years to actually verify this. And it was um, uh, Rhinus and Cowan that um, built an experiment. Uh, they essentially took a big tank, filled it with liquid, and uh, they put it next to a nuclear reactor where you have lots of these nuclear reactions that produce neutrinos. And then they found that indeed these neutrinos came out of nu nu nuclear reactions. And they sent a telegram to Pauli. And uh, at the time, they didn't have email, of course, or the web. And uh, Pauli wrote back, well, thanks for the message. Everything comes to him who knows how to wait. So uh, 25 years after he had said, well, there has to be this building block, there have to be neutrinos, there was the experimental observation. And one of the things uh, to take away from this is sometimes science takes a long time, but in the end, you'll get the answer. So as long as you're patient, you'll get uh, yeah, the right answer. And this was the beginning of a research field that is now growing and keeping us occupied and will keep us occupied for decades uh, to come. So in the 70s, people got more sophisticated. They actually managed to uh, image the interaction of neutrinos. So this is an image from a so-called um, uh, bubble chamber. It's a little bit like the cloud chamber that you may have seen outside where you can look at cosmic rays going through. So they, had, they built a bubble chamber and you had a neutrino coming in and it interacted with other matter in this chamber and you got other particles coming out and then you see the tracks of these particles. And uh, so, so this is the first image of a neutrino interaction in a detector. And uh, nowadays we have built very sophisticated detectors so we, we, we can really map the um, structure and particles that come out of these um, yeah, interactions. So how do we actually do this? I've told you about the universe, there are lots of neutrinos, but how do we actually learn about them? So the first thing we have to do is we have to go to a place where we can study neutrinos. And that for us involves going deep underground. Most of my professional life I've spent underground. In mines, in underground laboratories, I've, I've not seen the sunlight. And this has to do with the fact that there are all these cosmic rays coming down from space. So if you take a look at the cloud chamber outside, you see these tracks of particles. These are cosmic rays that just impinge on us from space. And this is yeah, illustrated here. Now, if I build a detector and I just let it sit here, the only thing I would see are cosmic rays but I would not see these very faint, feeble neutrinos. And so to do that, we have to go underground. And literally what we do is we seek the darkest, deepest places on Earth where we can build our experiment. The very first experiment that I uh, worked on was in a nickel mine in Ontario, Canada. We went 6,800 feet underground with all the miners and uh, they built us a, um, a room about 10 stories high under, underground, and we built an experiment there. So for uh, yeah, some seven years, I went underground almost daily like this, 
and I put on a suit and I have my mining certificate so if physics doesn't work out I can go mining in Canada <laughs> um, and we did uh, yeah, physics experiments there. This is what we um, built down there. This is 6,800 feet underground. It's a 10-story building that houses what's called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. And uh, basically it was a detector that had a big sphere filled with water and then lots of sensors, light sensors, on the outside. So when a neutrino uh, hits the detector, it produces light that we, we can then see in this um, experiment. Now, uh, this is what it looked like after we had completed it. It's this gigantic 18-meter uh, yeah, uh, diameter um, yeah, sphere. And you can see a fisheye uh, view here. And uh, basically what happens is the neutrino, because it's so weakly interacting, it can go through the Earth. It's not stopped. All the cosmic rays are stopped by the 6,800 feet of ground above us. But the neutrino goes through. And when the neutrino hits the water in this detector, then it produces some light that we, we can see. So again, what we do here is we build a detector that allows us to see the visible light from the invisible neutrino. And then we put it on a computer dis display, and this is actually what it looks like. This is a signature of a neutrino 6 to 800 feet underground uh, from the sun. And of course, people have gotten very ambitious. This is a picture of a similar neutrino detector in Japan. Again, it's underneath a mountain in an old mine. And what you are looking at here is a very large cavity filled or instrumented with all of these photosensors. And this was during the process when they were filling it with water. It was so large that people had to take a boat to, uh, to float and service all of these um, photosensors. So this is a cavity about 50 meters high, I think, uh, 30 meter uh, diameters, and it's now filled completely with water. And when a neutrino goes through there, again, it produces this light that we can see with all of these photosensors on the wall. This is what they have measured. Who recognizes at least one of these pictures? What are you look, looking at? Yes. What do you see there? Want to say? Hmm? Okay. Yes, you. Yes, it is the sun. This is the sun, how everyone sees it. You step outside in the morning or evening and you see the sun. This is the sun as seen in ultraviolet light or x-rays. So if you're an astronomer, if you fly a satellite, this is what you might see. This is the sun, 6,800 feet underground in neutrino light. So basically, what I like to tell uh, my students and people who work with me, of course you'll see the sun when you do research with me. Just look at the neutrinos. So, so this is a picture that was taken with one of these detectors looking at the neutrinos coming from the sun, but you're deep un underground to get away from all the cosmic rays. So deep, going deep underground is not enough for um, yeah, some of the research that we do. And uh, some of the experiments that we've built are at even more remote places, like for example, the South Pole. And uh, this is a picture of um, Antarctica. And the South Pole is yeah, pretty much in the middle. And this is what um, the view, the aerial view from the, uh, looks like at the South Pole. When you actually travel there, you fly in by airplane and uh, you have the um, US South Pole Station and you have lots of buildings and supplies there. You have an airstrip, a runway where you land. And then you have several different experiments and some of them are also looking for neutrinos. And you might wonder, well, why do we go to the South Pole? It's pretty far away. It's even re more remote than just going 
underground. And it turns out it's a place where, again, you can put your detector deep underground to get away from cosmic rays. It's a very quiet place. You don't have much disturbing um, radiation. And you get all the water that I told you about in our detectors for free. It's just in frozen form. So, so what uh, was done at the South Pole is the following. They've built a neutrino detector two and a half kilometers deep into the uh, Antarctic ice. And so uh, when you go to the South Pole, this is what you see on top. It's essentially a hut frozen over where all the electronics is. And then they have drilled holes a mile and a half deep into the ice. And they have placed these photosensors that I mentioned. And now neutrinos that come from space, they can go through the ice. And uh, again, they can create this light. And this light can travel through the Antarctic ice, because the Antarctic ice is very pure. And then it can be picked up by these uh, photosensors. So that's another way of detecting new neutrinos. You just use the Antarctic ice shield, essentially, as your, um, your detector. So one of the things that I just wanted to emphasize is neutrinos are so weakly interacting, they go through everything. They go through us. They go through stars. They can go through the Earth. It doesn't matter whether you're on one side of the Earth or the other. The neutrinos just go right through. Just remember the ball bearing dropping from the airplane. That's what the neutrino sees as it approaches the Earth. It's essentially nothing. The Earth is nothing. So, and this is the reason why we can also see neutrinos from some very spectacular cosmic events. Supernovae are exploding stars. So at the end of the uh, life of a star, it gets very dense, and then it explodes. And it turns out that initially, it's so dense, the light can't come out. But the neutrinos can. So the first signature that we get from an exploding star is essentially neutrinos coming to Earth. And astronomers are looking for it. They are trying to see the neutrinos first, and then point the telescope at the sky to detect the later light from um, exploding stars. I also mentioned that neutrinos come from inside the Earth. And I just wanted to um, uh, say a couple of words about that. Again, inside the Earth, you have nuclei, nuclei that decay. It actually turns out that the decays of nuclei in the Earth are the ones that give the heat, that uh, heat up the Earth. And uh, so we, we can see neutrinos that come from the mantle and crust of um, the Earth. And uh, this is a picture that shows you the uh, neutrinos that are coming from inside. So where there's continents, you have many more neutrinos coming out than where there's ocean. It also turns out that neutrinos come from nuclear reactors, because you have nu nuclear reactions in, in there. And this is where a lot of my research is taking place. We just go near nuclear reactors, commercial power plants, because all the neutrinos are coming out, and we can place our experiments and study the properties of uh, neutrinos. And this is what the uh, uh, neutrino landscape, the, the neutrino world map, looks like in terms of reactor neutrinos. So this figure shows you the distribution of neutrinos from reactors in the world. And you can see clearly the countries and the regions where there are lots of reactors. Europe, the US, and of course, uh, Asia and Japan had a lot of reactors before they were shut down. Now, what have we learned? Now, one of the things that we learned, which was quite fundamental about yeah, 13, 14 years ago, that neutrinos, even though they almost move at the speed of light, they do have a tiny little bit of mass. And um, so they make up a part of the mass of the universe. And this has some really interesting consequences. We initially thought that neutrinos essentially come in three flavors, like or uh, three colors, like blue, yellow, and green. Now, it turns out that this is not really the case. Because neutrinos have mass, they have a very strange phenomenon. And that is 
that they can change color. So instead of thinking about neutrinos in three colors, we now have to think about neutrinos in terms of being a mixture of something. And if I take a jelly bean from one of these jars, I don't know whether I get a blue, yellow, or green neutrino. And this is a phenomenon, this is a quantum mechanical phenomenon that is a direct result of the fact that neutrinos um, have mass. So this transformation of neutrinos takes place over space and time. So when a neutrino is created, it travels through space. It might start out as a yellow one, but then it turns into a green or a blue, blue one. And um, I have a couple of um, yeah, demonstrations to um, yeah, illustrate this. And it's a little bit like sound. And let me just um, show this to you. So imagine our neutrino is like a sound wave. This is one kind. Let's say this is, this is the yellow neutrino. The blue neutrino has a slightly different tone, but it's also there all the time. If you hear them separately, you can't really say that this one is 401 hertz, the other one is 400 hertz. They almost sound the same. Now, what I do is I put both of these neutrinos together. And let's see what happens. Two neutrinos with slightly different colors or slightly different uh, sound. I get this weird beat pattern. And this is essentially what happens uh, with neutrinos. The yellow neutrino appears and disappears. And appears and disappears. And the same with the blue neutrino. It appears and disappears. And this is what uh, we call new neutrino oscillations. Neutrinos are really waves. They're almost like sound. And um, the different colors are represented by the different um, yeah, tones here. And this is the reason why we can't really say, well, there is just one color of neutrinos or the other. It continuously changes. And this was uh, yeah, one of the, uh, um, the important things that uh, we discovered about 14 years ago. Now let me uh, just uh, take a few more minutes to um, tell you a little bit about, well, why this uh, matters. Why do we care about neutrinos? I mean, we, we can't see them. Um, we have to go underground to look at them. So why do we go through all of this? And this has to do with one big question in physics and cosmology that we can't answer yet. And that has to do, why do we live in a universe of matter? Now, the idea is that at the very beginning of time, there was this big bang. And in physics, we always have matter and antimatter. We have particles and antiparticles. For every particle, we have something that's opposite. And if you bring them together, they annihilate, they create energy. And I'm sure you've heard about it in Star Wars and other. Uh, if, if we could only bring matter and antimatter together, we would have solved our energy crisis. I mean, that's, uh, that's for sure. So the question now is, if in the beginning of time, there was this big bang, when we created almost equal amounts of matter and antimatter, why are we here? Why haven't we annihilated with the anti uh, part of ourself? And um, so there has to be a certain imbalance. And we are trying to understand where this imbalance comes from. So 14 billion years ago, we think there was an almost equal amount of matter and antimatter. But if you look at the universe nowadays, well, what we see is there's matter, there are galaxies, there are human beings, there's the Earth. So we are just the ones that are left over, us. But the anti-us doesn't exist. And so it turns out that to answer this question, neutrinos may play a um, fundamental role. 
And uh, one of the questions that has to do with this is that neutrinos may be their own antiparticles. And to do this, we're um, now mounting experiments that look at properties of neutrinos. And again, we're going deep underground. This is an experiment in Italy where we sit, literally sit underneath this mountain to get away from cosmic rays. And we look at nuclear decays to figure out if neutrinos and antineutrinos are the same particles. And um, we also are starting to plan experiments that uh, try to look at the uh, change of neutrinos and antineutrinos over distance. There's a very ambitious project in the US that wants to shoot a neutrino and an antineutrino beam from Chicago to a mine in South Dakota. And this is over a thousand kilometers and we could see how the neutrinos change. And it all has to do with the fact, well, we want to understand if neutrinos and antineutrinos are the same thing or not. Now, let me uh, come to the end and um, uh, leave you with perhaps one thing. And uh, this is okay. We want to understand if neutrinos are their own antiparticles. And um, this is probably one of the most important questions um, in, in our field. So, uh, neutrino physics, I should uh, say, is a big effort. It's a collaborative effort. You can imagine that these detectors that I showed you take a lot of people to build, a lot of students, a lot of postdocs. And uh, so usually we work in a group of people. And uh, this is one of the things that I found fascinating in science. We get a chance to work with people all over the world. I've gone to Antarctica, China, Italy, and Japan just to study neutrinos. And um, it's when you work with people all over the world that that's when you combine science and scientific endeavor with also your social interactions and uh, it becomes a very inspiring and fun thing um, yeah, to do. Now, at the very end, let me leave you with one thing. And that is that there are so many neutrinos. Everyone take up their thumb. So you see your thumb. If you look at your thumb for one second, you have billion, billions of neutrinos going through it. And they go right through your body and they don't hurt you but uh, there are as much matter in the universe as all the stars you see in the sky. So thank you, and I'm around to take questions. <laughs>